We, uh, we started uh, last week as we're in the, the month of Thanksgiving, as we're leading up to Thanksgiving. I started last week with, this, with our series uh, entitled Jehovah Jireh. And uh, if you weren't here last week, some of you may be looking uh, real funny, not knowing what Jehovah Jireh means. But Jehovah Jireh literally is translated God our provider or the Lord is our provider. And uh, as we go into Thanksgiving, it's helpful for us to always remember and always look back and notice how much of a provider that God is. Uh, God provides us with everything that we need. And, and when we talk about uh, God being our provider, most people, or a lot of people, when you talk about providing, we start thinking about food. We start thinking about housing. We start, th we start thinking about our physical needs. And we will get to that, I promise you, because uh, we'll, we'll talk more uh, as we go in the next couple of weeks about some of our physical needs. But one thing that we wanted to, I wanted to cover is uh, that God provides so much more than our physical needs. Uh, you know what? If we never had any of our physical needs met, the other things that God provides for us is more than enough. Um, we looked last week and we talked about uh, Abraham. If you weren't here last week, we talked about Abraham and how Abraham went up on the mountain with Isaac, his son, uh, preparing to offer him as a sacrifice because God had called him and God had told him to go and offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Now, as they went up on the mountain, Isaac noticed we don't have a lamb. What are, we going to, what are we going to sacrifice? How are we going to have a sacrifice? And Abraham looked at him and said, The Lord will provide the lamb. <coughs> Folks, that to me, Abraham was talking physically at that moment. Abraham, Abraham didn't have a clue what was coming. He didn't, he didn't realize how much, how important the thing that he said right there meant. Because as we go on in life, we can see that God did provide the lamb, that Jesus Christ is the lamb that God provided. You see, the thing is, is that God has requirements. God has a requirement for us, and that requirement is, is that there would be a sacrifice made. And he would not require us a sacrifice or require us to pay something that we couldn't pay unless he provided the means to pay it. And therefore, when Abraham said the Lord will provide the lamb, he was talking really about Jesus Christ. The sacrifice is required. The sacrifice will always be required. We're all still sinners. We're all still, we all still fail. And for that reason, we will always, there will always be the sacrifice required. The sacrifice that you can't pay, the sacrifice I can't pay, but Jesus Christ, the lamb, was provided by God. But also along with that, God has another requirement. You see, we are, we are called to salvation. Jesus Christ came and he paid the price for us. He, he gave us the opportunity that we can come to know him. But there are some requirements. There are some things that he wants from us. There are some things that he desires from us. And that is that if we accept his salvation, he wants repentance. He wants us to have a new life. As a matter of fact, when he was asked, Lord, what does it take? What, what does it take to have the kingdom of God? Jesus' answer was simple. You must be born again. Now, you all have heard me say this over and over and over, and you know that I, how I believe on it. I believe, that, I believe that so many times we have watered down what the true meaning of salvation is. I think that, we have, that so many pastors over the years trying to evangelize and trying to get more people to come to the Lord have, have watered down what it means to be saved. They have, they have just said, all you've got to do is believe. All you've got to do is believe. That is a misconception. You see, because Jesus said, you must be born again. To be born again means that you become a new person. It means that you have a new life. It means that you give up your old life. 
It means that you become a new creature. But how do we do that? How do we, how do we get rid of our sin nature? How do, we, how do we overcome our sin nature? Let me tell you something. None of us will ever live perfectly. We know that. None of us will ever be able to escape from sin completely. But how do we get rid of our sin nature? We have to depend on the Lord to give us a divine nature. To get past that sin nature, we have to depend on God. Imagine that if you were raising a child, and many of us here have raised children, but imagine you tell your child, here's what I expect from you. When they're just a little bitty thing, you tell them, this is, this is my expectation of you. I expect that you're going to grow up strong, you're going to grow up healthy, you're going, to, you're going to do great things, you're not going to do bad things, and you're going to live a righteous life. And then you never gave them any guidance. You never helped them along the way, you just turned them loose. So this is what I expect of you, you're on your own. What do you think they would turn out like? Some would say they turn out like the generation we've got coming. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> no, we've got some, listen, as, as depressing sometimes as we look at some of the generation, there's still a lot of hope in our generations to come. And, uh, folks, we've got we've to be there for them to, to guide them along because that's what it takes. It takes somebody, in order to see a child grow to be strong, healthy, it takes somebody who teaches them how to eat, how to eat properly, how to put away all the sweets so they don't end up looking like me. We have to, we have to, we have to teach them. Listen, you don't have to teach a child to do what's wrong, but we have to teach them to stay away from the things that are wrong and how to, how to, to go toward the things that are good. We have to teach them these things. You can't just tell them, this is what I expect of you. If you were to do that and you were to tell a child that I expect you to, to grow up right and I expect you to, to be successful and then just send them out, listen, you would be considered a bad parent. You would be. There's one thing we can't say about God. You cannot say that God is a bad parent. Because God does not do that. You see, God says, I have expectations. I expect you to live a godly life. I expect you to live in a certain way. I expect you to live in a way that is pleasing to me. But he didn't just say, this is what I expect. Go do it. No, he gives us what we need. You see, God is the perfect father. Second Peter Chapter 1, we'll see how he does this. 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you today uh, that you don't just leave us out here. That, Lord, that you love us enough to guide us and lead us and give us your divine nature so that, Lord, we can live a godly life for you. In your name we pray, amen.
The first thing I want to point out here is who, G who Peter is talking to. Peter makes it very plain who he's talking to when he says, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He tells us here that he is talking to those people who have obtained like faith. Now, you didn't obtain this faith by going out and buying it. You didn't obtain this faith by going out and looking for it or working for it or any of those things. You obtained this faith through a free gift. And he makes that plain. You've made, you have obtained this faith. This is to all people who, in other words, who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's who Peter's talking to. He's talking to Christians here. He's not talking to the non-Christians. He's not talking to those people he's trying to evangelize. Here he's talking to you and to me. He's talking to all those people who have accepted Jesus Christ and who have, have knelt to him. So as he's looking at these, he says this precious faith. He also acknowledges something. He says, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to point out something here. We had some, we, we, I've actually had the opportunity in the, in the past week to interact with, with people of different faith, different faiths, that uh, they, they think that they have the same God. They think they have the same, you know, some of them, uh, we, we had a lady here, uh, Wednesday night, uh, she came to help with the shoe boxes, and and uh, but she was not of the same faith as we are, and um, they feel like they are Christians, and uh, but they're not, and here's why. Peter says, "Our God and Savior Jesus Christ." They don't acknowledge Jesus Christ as God. They, they acknowledge Jesus Christ as a good man. They, let me tell you something. Jesus is not a good man. Jesus is not a good teacher. Jesus is not a prophet. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is not, now I know this is going to shock some of you, Jesus is not the Son of God. Jesus is God. Now, those were all the roles that he took on. Those are the things that he took on when he came to this world. Those are the, that, that is the skin, that is the, the, the humanity that he put on while he was on this earth for you and for me. But, Jesus, but Peter acknowledged it here, and in order to be a Christian, and in order to, to be able to say, I am of like faith, and in order to be able to say that I am a Christian, and I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I have to acknowledge him as more than the Son of God, more than a good teacher, more than a prophet. I have to acknowledge him as God who is part of the tr Trinity same as God the Father God the Son God the Holy Ghost they are all the same God in whatever form that we need him to be in that's what he is to us and we have to acknowledge him as such in order to be one of these that Peter is talking about here that's just a short commercial break there about who Jesus is. Peter put it in there, and I wanted to cover that really well. But then he goes on as he lets us know that he is talking to Christians here, not, not just good people, not, not just Jews. He's talking to all Christians. He says, we have received this gift we have obtained this, this faith. But upon obtaining this faith, upon receipt of this salvation, we know that Jesus expects us to go into repentance. We know that Jesus expects us to live a godly life. So how can we do that? It says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In other words, because of God and his divine power, he has given you everything you need in order to live a godly life. He did not just save you from hell. 
He didn't... He, he would not call you to live a godly life and leave you here to fail. Jesus did not save you to live an ungodly life. He, did not, he, he would not save you to leave you the way that you were. You see, Jesus didn't just die to save us from hell. He died to save us from sin. He died to save us from the world. And because of that, he gives us the means to overcome the world. He gives us the means to overcome sin. He gives us the means to overcome our sin nature. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are given this, this great thing that we can have, and it's, it's through his divinity. It says that he gives us what we need that pertain to life, and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. You see, he gives us this. He, he is full of glory. And he brings us this virtue. And, and because of that, listen, he wants us to have this knowledge of him. And, and, and that knowledge of him, you cannot, let me tell you something, you cannot live a Christian life if you don't know who Christ is. Now you might, you might come and you might, I, I've known a lot of people that's walked the aisle and they've, they've come and they've given their heart, they've truly given their heart to Jesus. But let me tell you something, if you don't study his word and you don't get to know who he was and who he is and what he's done for you, you will never be able to live a life like him. You see, that's what Christianity is, is, is living a Christian life, which is living a Christ-like life. If you don't study his word, if you don't have a knowledge of him, then how can you live like him? I've known people that have, that have set their goals and they, and they watch a pastor or they watch their Sunday school teacher and they try to pattern their life after a pastor or after their Sunday school teacher. And, and, and listen, because they don't, they don't study and they don't have that knowledge of Jesus. And they don't really know. And, and that's, that's all they know is what somebody else is living. Let me tell you something. Don't pattern your life after me. I pattern my life after Jesus Christ. But listen, I'm not perfect. I learned a long time ago, any of you have ever done any carpentry or any kind of, of uh, well, any kind of construction or anything, if you're making something, say you're making banisters for a rail, you don't, you don't take this one and use it for a pattern and then take that one that you just cut and use it for the pattern for the next one and take that one and use it for the pattern for the next one. Listen, by the end of about 10 of them, you're going to be an inch longer. You're going to get a saw width on every one of them. No, what you do is you pattern after the original. You keep going back to the original. And that's how we're supposed to live our life in Jesus Christ. And it takes getting to know him. It, ca it takes having a knowledge of him in order to live like him. And he provides us with that. Listen, he gives us a divine nature. And because of that divine nature, that divine nature will overcome that sin nature. But we have to be willing to take it. And we can escape the world of corruption. Notice it says, through lust. Y'all remember what James said? What draws us away? What draws us into sin? It's not Satan's temptation. It's our own lust. It's our own desires that we allow to have control. When we become a Christian, God, God provides us with that, with that divine nature. But what do we do with it? Do we accept that divine nature? Do we take that divine nature and let it live in our lives? Or do we continue to make excuses? You see, it's easier sometimes to make excuses and say, well, you know, all people have a sin nature. Nobody's perfect. We're all, all are sinners. So we make these excuses rather than live up to what we are, what we're supposed to live up to. But he calls us to have 
a divine nature. As we go on in verse 5, it says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence. In other words, have determination. If you want to, if you want to live like Christ, you want to live a godly life, you've got to have some diligence. You've got to be determined to do so. Don't go into being a Christian half-heartedly. That's not what Jesus asked. It says, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he is, was cleansed from his old sin. We look at this, and, and I, I love how Peter breaks this down. You've got faith. Faith is what brings you to Jesus. Faith is what brings you to God. But faith, you've got to add on to it. You see, it's a process. Becoming, becoming a Christian is, yes, you accept him all at once, but listen, live, becoming a true Christian, which means living a Christ-like life, is a process because you take that faith and you build upon it. You see, so many people, they try to just get the faith and then stop. But see, he says that we've got to add to it. We've got to build upon it in order to live our life and be, be considered a godly person in order to, to receive the rewards. We need to build Build upon the faith that we have and take that virtue, which is a moral, living a moral life. Being a moral person is virtuous. That's what he's talking about, is being moral. Then we take that, and once we, once we look at this being moral and um, being dedicated to living this life, and we start to, to live this moral life, have high moral standards, then we add the knowledge, okay? We start to try to live a moral life, and then we start to get to know Jesus better. Let me tell you something. I, I think that every Christian, everyone who claims to be a Christian should read your Bible through on a regular basis. I'm not saying every year, but I, 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 I don't know how many people that I've known how many Christians that I've known who have never read their Bible through? I think that it should be a goal of every Christian to at least read it through once. I've read it through several times, and every time I read it, I learn something new. I remember one time that I was, I was, uh, I was 21 years old, and I was teaching the senior adult ladies Sunday school class. Imagine that. And... Uh, one of the ladies in my class who had been my grandmother's best friend for years and years. And I remember her telling me that one time. She said, I just got through reading my Bible through again. And she said, I, 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 I find something new every time I read it. She was about 90 years old at the time. And, uh, you know, here I am. I was 21 trying to teach that class. And I just, I, let me tell you, I learned more that year than I, I pr probably ever did even through seminary. But listen, we should have that desire. We should have a desire to know him deeper, know him better. Once we have that knowledge... You can't, live, you can't live a Christ-like life if you don't know who Christ is. Then we add self-control. Self-control. Listen, we're not a bunch of animals. I remember when I was teaching youth, I, I, I used to, um, people would, would talk about youth like, you know, that's just the way they are. Listen, we're not animals. We have, we have choices. And if, if we make, listen, don't ever say when you sin that you couldn't help it. Every sin is a choice, and it's up to us to have that self-control. And that, listen, you, can't ha you won't have that self-control starting out. 
That's something that you develop. That's something that you learn. That's something that, that after, as Peter says here, you add to your virtue, then you add to your knowledge. Then you start to obtain that self-control. And then he says to self-control, perseverance. Now perseverance, that's a, that's a big one. How many of y'all have ever watched somebody as they become a Christian? And it's such a great thing to see somebody uh, become a new Christian. And, and listen, they get excited. And I remember, I remember when I, when I, I still remember when I first became a Christian. I was so excited. I wanted to tell everybody. And we see this and we see people with this excitement and we see them, they want to live their life in the right way and they want to live their life for God and they want, and, and, and then you see it start to burn out. You start, you start to see it, it dwindle. Listen, Jesus told uh, the church of Thyatira in Revelation. He says, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him, I will give power over the nations. You see, Jesus here told the church of Thyatira, have perseverance. That's what we're told to do. We, we as Christians, we're supposed to hold out. We're supposed to continue to live, not just have a spurt, not just get excited for a little while and then dwindle away. No, we're supposed to live the Christian life. We're supposed to live for him from the day we accept him to the day we die. That's what he expects from us. That's what he wants from us. With perseverance, then we have godliness. Once we, once we have come to this point, once we have come further, we start to, people start to notice. And people should be able to see that you're living a godly life. Now this doesn't all come on your own account. This comes through that divine nature. But then as you receive that divine nature that God gives you, you are expected to build upon it. But he will give you the strength. He will give you what you need to get to this point. And then comes the hard part. Once you get to this godliness, you've come through all this, Then we have brotherly kindness. It seems like that's the hardest thing for a lot of Christians. Have you ever noticed that? You can have people out there that they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't cuss, they don't, they don't beat their kids, they don't cheat on their wife, they don't, uh, they don't do any of these bad things, they don't cheat people. But it's hard to get them to say a kind word to somebody. They're They're hateful. They're hard to, hard to get along with. How many of y'all know Christians like this? They may live a good life out there in the world, but it's just hard to take them. Listen, with, this is part of it. And, and I think that's why this is near the end of the list. This is, this is we build upon these things. And as you start to do this, listen, we need to become kind people. We as Christians, we need to be kind one to another. We're not only to those people outside the church, but to the people inside the church. We're supposed to be kind. And all of that before we ever get around to love. We want to, we come to all these things and all these, these great things that Peter says. Then he tells us, if you're not doing these things, if this is not part of your life, if this is not part of your Christian life, then you're missing something. He says, if this is not you, if you're not added to all these things, then you are unfruitful. You're barren. You've forgotten that you've even been cleansed. You're blinded to the fact that Jesus changed you. Listen, God provided a way, not just of salvation, but to live a godly life. And if you choose not to live a godly life, you've missed the whole point. You've missed all that Jesus has done for you. Because what Peter said here, you have forgotten 
that you was even cleansed from your sin. You see, He didn't save us to leave us. He didn't save us to leave us in the, in the filth that He found us in. He saved us to clean us. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, if you find yourself in a position where you just cannot, you, you, just, can't, you just can't live a Christian life. You, you find it so hard to live a Christian life and you're just not able to do it. You can't get out of the things that you, that, that you started out in and you're, you're, you're still living the same way that you were before you made a profession. Jesus, Peter said, make your election sure. If you're here today and you, you may have walked the aisle, you may have said the sinner's prayer, you may have been baptized, but if you got up and you left and there was no change in your life, and you look at these, this list of things and, and that's not you, you just can't live that Christian life. You've not been living a godly life. You find it so hard to live for Christ. Peter says, make your election sure. I'll tell you something, if you truly accept Jesus as your Savior, then He gives you what you need to live for Him. And if you just can't live for Him, folks, it may be, it, it may be that you never accepted Him as your Savior to be for, for real. This morning, I'm going to invite you when we, um, when we close out here to come and just make sure. As Peter said, make your election sure. Because he wants you not only to be his child, but to live for him. But if you're here this morning and you've you just had a hard time. Maybe it's, maybe it's just recently. Maybe it's just been a spurt. Maybe it's been a... a, a, a a period of your life that you've had a hard time living for Him. You know you made, you, you know you made Him your Lord at one point. You know that you accepted Him as your Savior. But you've just had a hard time. Let me tell you something. He wants to bring you back around. He provides a way for you to live for Him. Whatever you need this morning, whether it's salvation for the first time, whether it's just to, to, to give your heart to him and say, Lord, I know I have failed you. Help me back through. Whatever you need this morning, as we stand. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your salvation. But Lord, we thank you also for your grace for the grace that you give us to teach us and to direct us to live for you. Lord, if there's one here today that does not know you, Lord, I pray that you would just bring them to you today. Lord, for those that do know you, whatever it is that they need, whatever that they need to live their life uh, pleasing to you, then Lord, I just pray that you would draw them. In your name we pray, amen.